um, Hugh, I think uh, it's um, you might be respondent in some way afterwards, or sort of invite you for initial response in any case. Um, but when when we do get through it, so yeah, just to maybe introduce um, uh, Nula uh, O'Donovan. Um, Nula is, is a ceramicist who makes sculptural work referring to the historical traditions uh, of geometry pattern and abstracted natural forms in art. She's a graduate of Middlesex University in the UK and has awarded um, several distinctive awards, uh, including an MFA from the Crawford College of Art in 2008. And she's the recipient of a number of major <clears throat> national and international awards for her sculptural work in, in clay since, since 2008, um, including the inaugural Irish Arts Review and DCC. Uh, OI Emerging Maker Award in 2008 and then the Golden Fleece Award in 2019. Um, I believe her work is exhibited and held by a number of collections internationally, um, uh, private and uh, also amongst the National Museum of Ireland, Ulster Museum, um, and the, she's part of the kind of guild or the member of the Visual Artists of Ireland and the, the Royal Society of Sculptures. So N Nula is interested in narrative quality uh, uh, of irregularities in patterns, what she describes as, quote, the history behind a scarred or broken surface uh, uh, is the record, she says, of the ability of living organisms to recover, to respond, and to continue growing and changing. She says that she finds these forms inspiring, uh, arguing that they illustrate the beauty and fascination of the imperfect. So her talk today, uh, it, it looks to be really interesting from, from what we've conversed on uh, uh, over the last week or two. Um, so in the, in the talk, she's, she'll reveal her, I guess her distinctly architectural kind of thinking uh, in her design and making processes. And she'll also preview some of her recent work uh, that were developed through a residency at the, uh, the Cultural Centre Ireland in, in, in Paris, where her intention was to research conservation um, and repair work at the Sev Pottery Workshops. Uh, however, with the closure of these facilities for most of her time in Paris, uh, due to the COVID-19 restrictions, um, Nula will outline how she looked at buildings within a, interesting, within a one kilometre lockdown walking radius um, uh, for inspiration. And then I think particularly noting uh, the ongoing uh, repair work to the fire damaged Notre Dame Cathedral. So she'll consider how her reading of the scaffolding around the cathedral, the wrapping of it, the structural supports for it, uh, of the building during the repair work impacted her own studio and design research. I uh, begin to define those particular actions or practices on the cathedral as a distinct critique of, of value. So it sounds really interesting. Uh, Nula has invited uh, everyone as a, as a kind of respondent uh, to, to, uh, to think about these ideas of repair, conservation, preservation and replication practices, and maybe to have some thoughts on that uh, when the talk includes, and uh, maybe he would kind of kick off those responses to start with. So I'm going to hand it over to Nula. Well, thank you, first of all, for inviting me to speak. I'm quite a little bit daunted, but anyway. Um, so I thought um, what I would do first is, is just give a description of my work for anybody that doesn't know it. And uh, my working methods, the reasons why I make work, and my research into, into form and pattern. And then, um, as you said, um, you know, I went to... Uh, Paris really to do research on on uh, progressing my work and I was very interested in um, composite structures and looking at things like prosthetics repair um, as a sort of indicators of value and changing the nature of something um, so it was looking at that kind of metamorphosis or, or, or each pieces of my work as composites of, of bigger pieces so that was kind of my my aim going there and it sort of, it, it, it worked out well anyway, because it made me sort of condensed what I was looking at. So uh, anyway, I'll just start off uh, looking at my work. Um, my work is, I'm, I'm very interested in pattern. And my work is based on patterns from natural forms. Um, when I started researching, um, making work, uh, I had a lot of, a lot of uh, sort of endless sources 
of pattern, but my, my big difficulty was in translating that into form. So I started looking at, I was very interested, first of all, in, in early Christian and Islamic pattern and how that is, is applied to form. So I started researching that and I found quite a lot of references to classical geometry in how um, the, the forms uh, progressed from pattern. And, and that's how I started off working. But um, I found when I was working that what interested me about natural uh, forms and pattern was, was the aberrations, the irregularities, and how that indicated some kind of event in the life of, um, of, of the form, of living forms. Um, and I just found these pieces to be more dynamic, um, more interesting, and I'll just explain it through, through uh, some of the slides here. Um, so this, this image really just indicates how I started off the research. It was really looking at um, classical geometry and human form, forms in nature, and how really all of the um, uh, kind of geometry and that translation of that geometry into a sort of an aspiration to the divine in, in, in architecture, in Western architecture. Um, so it was looking at a sort of aspiration um, to perfection because that's what um, the, you know, the, the divine was considered to be. And then, you know, these, these proportions, these ratios uh, were used in music, in, in architecture, in art, um, uh, really uh, in, throughout really Western history. Um, these were the patterns that I started looking at. And this was a sea urchin, which would conform to regular geometry, classical geometry. Um, it would, you know, increasing proportions and measurements as the pattern moves around, the form is regular, it's circular. Um, but what happened within these patterns, there, there were some which, you know, you'd get a, an element of the pattern which was uh, irregular but whatever, you know, the DNA within the organism would, would, would correct it so that the form would still be regular. Um, and so it was really sort of identifying that part, that, it, that, that part of the, of the piece that inter interested me. But I wasn't interested in, in, in pushing the forms that I made into, into a regular form. I thought it would be more interesting to, to follow the irregularity. So I started my research into fractal geometry, which is looking at what was termed ugly geometry back at the, the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, fractal geometry was defined in the, the 70s or 80s by Mandelbrot. And it's really looking at patterns in nature, which, is, which repeat um, the micro um, at the macro level. So, so each pattern, as you can see here, the trees, the riverbeds are an endless repetition of the same action, the same pattern. But what happens is you'll have random events which maybe change the course of it. But when you look at it, you instantly recognize what it is, even though it is irregular. But then it means also that the outcome of each, each form is unique because it it, it is of its time, it responds to the events, the events within it. But it had a connection with classical geometry in that um, it's self-similar, so it repeats proportions um, as, as classical geometry does, particularly um, Greek, uh, as the Greek aesthetic, which repeats proportions. And, and they believe that the repetition of proportional volume contributed to a dynamic form rather than just the repetition of measurements. And I think in, in further on in the Roman Empire, it was a re repetition, it was simplified into a repetition of measurements, which is supposed to be the reason why Greek and Roman sculptures, the Greek sculptures of the human form are more dynamic. So you can kind of judge that yourself if you ever get a chance to compare. Um, so this is, this is how I work. I, I started off with the, the Banksia flower and um, I would do a series of sketches and, and, and really take the structure apart to see how it works, to see how it goes together and um, separate it into individual elements. And based on my research into geometry, into fractal geometry in particular, I would just take one of those elements and, and repeat it within a form so that the form 
is self-similar. So this, th these were works that were based on the Banksia plant. And you can see where um, with the looping line structure, it's very much like a drawn line that was just one piece, one element from that um, quite complex flower and taking that out and then applying the rules of natural geometry, fractal geometry to that um, single element. And, and these were the resulting pieces. Um, and it was quite interesting with these pieces as well that um, I, I could ring, I, I could build them in, in, um, in a sort of regular form. And because of the structure of the piece, um, it would collapse or melt or move in the kiln because porcelain becomes quite viscous. Again, at high temperatures in a kiln, it also shrinks by 20%. So there's an awful lot of movement where the, the structure itself, you can see trails as it, as it moves in and it shrinks. And there's a point where the piece sort of melts and then stops depending as the temperature starts to cool again. So, I mean, I, I really liked this piece because it captured a movement of, of a, an inanimate object. Um, and um, there was, it, it was a more dynamic form, but, uh, at each piece, I should say, each piece that I make is, is in a series and each piece, the next piece will address something in the last piece. So with this piece, I kind of thought, you know, I love the way it is so, it is so fluid, but I would like to um, apply some sort of structure to it, which would constrain the movement. So I started using double layers and triangulation between, between the layers. So that as the piece moved in and became quite fluid, that the, the triangulated elements, although they're very fine, that they would control the movement of the piece. So this was the first in that series. And it was by, by kind of tweaking the structure, I could control the resulting form because it was moving so much. Um, and this was, this was a, another piece in that series. Um, and again, it, it, it's, it's looking at endless repetition. So the form is self-similar. It's, it's, it's a um, half circle. And um, the outer layers are again, just repetitions of the inner layers, but they're just the scale, the scale is varied. Um, so with all of these pieces, because they're based on fractal geometry, uh, the theory is that they can, you know, it's finished, but in a sense it can suggest an additional form. It can just continue. It's just stopped at this point. Um, and these were looking at pieces that work together. That was uh, the Banksia series again. And it's starting to look at two pieces. Uh, they're separate, but they're similar. And it's how um, they work as one piece. And then using reflection as well to just try and uh, continue with the fractal idea of, of endless repetition. Um, and this is a side view of those pieces. So one of the things that I quite like about using this sort of um, geometry or that I find, you know, I kind of enjoy is that, um, you know, with, with a natural form, you can, you can't really predict, you can predict the outcome once you know it. Um, but if you saw just a small section of something, you know, um, it, it's evident within the form itself but uh, it's sort of the idea that it makes sense when you see the piece as a whole, that it, it's, it's a sort of self-evident outcome, but it's not one that you could, without seeing the piece, you couldn't really see it. If, I don't know if that's a, that's probably a bit, uh, I hope that's clear, but it might be a bit off. Um, this was another series, it was based on Radiolarian, um, uh, organisms, and it was this piece in the center of the, the slide, where which was uh, based on uh, triangulated single elements. So I, having done lots of sketches and that, I just I isolated it down to one, one element, and I started making these cuboid structures based on um, the uh, the radiolaria structure, the interior structure, um, and and these again progress uh, with each piece and they were really testing the strength of uh, triangulating the structure and allowing it to move. 
and shrink and and it was just uh, amazingly strong because of because of the the way it was built um and this was a black piece i started putting colored sections in the center of these pieces because it was just to give your eye a focus because otherwise you know it was it was sort of because of the lines all over the place and it's kind of as you move around it it's it it uh, there's a, there's a um what would you call it a kinetic kind of quality to it that the lines blend and merge and then open out and then you can see it goes from regular to irregular um kind of like scaffolding um when i was uh looking at the last piece and um i kind of thought well you know if i follow my own rules the the struts are uh cylindrical so really what i should do is make the pieces cylindrical so this was a series of pieces um, that I made, which were called light tunnels. And these very much conform to regular geometry. So if you look at the um, rectangular square and rectangular, they're all based on golden section. And it's just an endless repetition of that principle within the piece that the volumes, the adjacent volumes are all proportional and based on, um, based on that uh, single proportion. Um, And this is a step on from the last piece as well, looking at cylindrical light tunnels. With these pieces, I started uh, doing something that, um, um, that I started working on the pieces uh, post firing. So uh, I wanted to make pieces that really uh, structurally were unfeasible if I fired them. So I would fire them and then look at subtracting. So it was carving from the finished pieces taking away sections so that the, the finished piece suggested um, a kind of other volumes rather than the volumes being there. And then I wanted to start placing them together as well so that they also suggest that maybe at some stage that they, um, they would have fitted together or they had some sort of relationship to each other. Um, and this is when I really started looking at, uh, for the last one, that looking at grouping work. Um, this is another series based on the teasel flower. Or the, and this was again, uh, taking the plant, reducing it to one element, and then applying uh, the principles of fractal geometry to this. And um, with this series, each one progresses on the last piece. So I started, this, this was far more, this, this was quite strong because it's three dimensional structure, but also it wasn't as strong as the grid structure. So I just started looking at um, intensifying the pattern at the edges to control the movement. Um, and, and so that allowed me to dramatically change the scale of the pieces. And this is, I'll just go through these. These, these just are all experiments based on the same pattern and controlling movement, creating structure. Um, and as you can see, each piece, each piece um, is unique and, and moves on from the last pieces. This was looking at open structures and creating, um, looking at the interior and exterior, because I, I, I find the interiors of these pieces interesting as well, looking at the back to see how they're built. And a lot of people who would be in my area would also be looking at that as well. So I've always found structure interesting. And this is a close up of that piece. So you can see the difference in scales and how the edges are controlled by using a very um, intense, dense uh, structure. Um, this is another one of that in that series. So I think you can kind of see my working method from there and really how everything, all of the pieces are linear. I can often work on a couple of series at, at the same time because they're slow. The next series were based on fragments of coral. And this is one that kind of experiments with looking at a piece of, of pattern from a living uh, form, but not having the whole form and basing the outcome on the pattern. Um, and this also took a lot of what I learned from the grid structures. So I would triangulate layers of kind of skin. So you could have these very, very light structures with a quite dense skin and then the triangulated structure, which was 
a repetition of the surface again. It was a three-dimensional form of the surface. Um, and so these are, this is a similar, similar, you can see that the, the interior is as, is as important really as the exterior, that it's all part of one piece. Uh, so these go on with experimenting with volume and layers and um, structure and some of them merge, like this would merge uh, part of the Banksia series with the Coral series, uh, which they kind of related and looking at taking away the skin and leaving the skeleton. So these slides look again at, uh, I really started to um, want to control how my work was shown more. So I started grouping pieces rather than having them dispersed uh, around a room. So I was really trying to take some control of how they're shown because to me there were relationships between pieces and I wanted to emphasize that. So I started photographing and, and showing them in pairs. And I, uh, I, I just find it interesting where you have two three-dimensional volumes and uh, you contrast the weight visually, physically, and, and just look at how they work together. Um, and this was using color as well, where the, the black, stained black um, pieces have a much heavier quality visually than the, um, the lighter pieces. So it was, it was kind of interesting to look at those two together. Um, and this is uh, pretty much more of that, uh, looking at um, structures and volumes and how they work together. Um, this piece was uh, taking the grid pieces and just expanding it more and seeing how far that could go as an irregular structure, um, how, how large it could be and how heavy it could be. Um, and this is just to give you an idea of the scale of the pieces. Um, because I think of the geometry they're based on, it's hard to have an idea of scale because they could be very large or they could be very tiny. Um, and this was uh, working with a curator, which was the first time my work was shown um, at, uh, on, on, you know, old palettes. And it, I just love the way the two work together where you get that weathered timber and um, uh, then the porcelain worked well against it. And it was kind of just interesting to see how they put it together. I think you always learn something from um, how other people see your work or view it. So um, this, this year uh, I was uh, given a, the opportunity to go to the Irish Cultural Centre in Paris. And I wanted to uh, progress my work in some way. Um, I wanted to look at, uh, I have a lot of pieces that are finished, but kind of unfinished. And I kind of thought, uh, I, I wanted to add to them, but I didn't want to add, you know, the same thing. I wanted to look at how, um, first of all, uh, conservation and looking at the way uh, obvious repairs are, 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 are indicate a value in, um, in, in ceramics as with everything, like you have old techniques, which would be uh, very classical Japanese techniques, kintsuge, and then also things like stitching. And if you see a piece of, of crockery and it's been stitched, it's a very clear indication that that's a valuable piece. It was either valuable to the person personally, or it was valuable financially. So I, I thought that that was an interesting idea, that the idea that was something was, someone went to the trouble to repair something um, and didn't hide the repair because that repair indicated the value of the piece. Um, so uh, and that was my intention. I was also um, researching artist residencies at SEV because they have a very long history of working with artists to develop new work. Um, and this was, um, oops, sorry. Uh, so this is my studio, you can all be jealous, here in the courtyard and uh, the front door, which opens onto the courtyard at the, the Irish Cultural Centre. Um, and it's almost like a small park full of really beautiful trees. And uh, you know, I'm there in autumn where the trees are just every day, you get, you know, layers of, of leaves and chestnuts and, um, so anyway, that's the environment and, and my studio is that little grey door behind the trees. Um, when, I, when I went in October, um, I did a lot of intensive 
museum visiting because I was afraid that they were going to lock them down. And this is the first one I went to see was the Museum Duque uh, Branley. Um, and a uh, beautiful uh, museum actually, but I was really struck by this collection of objects. I mean, and most of the work there was similar. Um, first of all, because it was a collection of objects put together as one piece and the shadow, the really strong shadow was part of the piece as well. So it made it, uh, gave it a three dimensional quality. Um, and then uh, on closer viewing, what I loved about these was that it was very uh, simple materials tied together, uh, tar with twine. Um, they were locally found, locally sourced and, and put together to, for these kind of objects of value. They're, they're uh, ceremonial pieces. Um, so it was kind of interesting to see how there was value created in these very everyday materials and objects as well. Um, and my next exhibition, I won't show you the good stuff, but this is the part I loved. This was the Jean-Claude and Christo exhibition. And these were the, uh, the, the equipment they used to, to wrap the buildings. Um, and that's something that I found really interesting was to see how it was done and all of these additional pieces that you don't see and you see the end result. Um, but I was interested in the, the whole idea of how they changed the character of, of, of the bridges and buildings they wrapped as well, that they kind of concealed and revealed in a way and that I, you know, that was kind of fascinating. Um, and this was en route to, to the Pompidou. And also this is my one kilometer radius area. This is the dome of San Suplice. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, I love the idea of scaffolding anyway, you know, and what I like about it is that you create a structure outside a structure, which gives you access to, to the original, to the dome. Um, and I suppose it's kind of related to the Pompidou as well. And um, then this, these are images of the, of the um, scaffolding um, at Notre Dame. So um, it kind of resonated with the whole uh, Christo and Jean-Claude exhibition where there were parts of the structure were wrapped, parts of the structure were scaffolded. And so it concentrates your view on the exposed parts. So parts are hidden. Um, and also just that kind of access into the interior. And then also all around the base uh, at the site, um, they've uh, photographed and catalogued the restoration. So there's images of, of, you know, piles of burnt pieces of timber, each piece numbered of charred bits of wood. Um, so they've, they've salvaged huge amounts from, from the fire, but it's, there are a lot of fragments that have been, that have been documented and uh, I'm not sure how they're going to reuse them, but it's kind of like, it's been documented almost like, it, well, it is an archeological dig. So um, they've mapped the locations and each piece and uh, store them away for reuse uh, or um, reference. Um, but these are more images of it. And I quite like the way the cranes kind of frame the building as well, almost like pointers into it. Um, but when I was looking at it, I, I am looking at the, the documentation of the salvage work. And, you know, I was kind of looking at it as, uh, it just occurred to me that there's an indication of value and of how uh, different communities or societies, how we value things and that the, this huge effort and the extent of the repair, it's sort of an indicator of the value of this building in Paris. Um, Um, so it's also the, the building is surrounded by, by trees and, I, I, you know, this one in particular on the left, I was kind of looking at this thinking, um, it's an amazing structure next to an amazing structure. Um, and I, I, I was thinking to myself, uh, what if we, what if we actually valued something like a tree as, as something that, you know, something created by human endeavor, like uh, Notre Dame, like, because I kind of thought to myself, if, 
if a person made a tree, you'd get all the Nobel Prizes because you've got a weather recording system, um, a drainage system, uh, uh, oxygen creation, um, perennially uh, regenerating. Um, it, it, you know, it, it's so multifunctional and also a thing of beauty. So uh, this was the beginning of my studio research. I, I, I thought to myself, what if, what if we treated, if that tree was, um, was treated in the same way as the, as the building next to it? And as it disintegrates in autumn that you cataloged and recorded and um, attempted to reconstruct it. And basically, what if you scaffolded trees to try and preserve them. Um, and this was the beginning of that research. Uh, I started looking at uh, this, these trees in Paris. A lot of them have this really dramatic scar tissue because they're uh, coppiced and trimmed and um, created or, or, or cut into regular forms. Um, so this was, this was the beginning of studio work, was looking at drawings of what was there and the idea of with, with the wrapping and layering and um, just the looking at my own work, if you had a fragment of tree, how would you reconstruct it? So I looked at doing drawings of, of multiples and seeing how, how it would come out based on a small fragment of it. Um, and this is taking single elements and um, recreating them. Uh, you know, isolating a single element and putting them together and seeing um, how it can come up with other structures. So this is going back to my own building technique really, which is to reduce something to one module and then um, remake it using different uh, principles. Um, and this is, uh, I suppose, scaffolding trees. This is what this is doing. It's taking parts of the tree and making it you know, isolating parts so that it, it, it changes your value, your perception of the value of the piece because it concentrates your view of it. You can see it within the structure, which is quite complex and obviously built to contain it. So um, it adds uh, value to it. And um, remaking structures using um, elements of, of, of tree debris really. Uh, and these were looking at Notre Dame and the way you take, you know, those charred pieces of timber and, you know, making them precious. Um, and during this work, this was uh, recording shadow, recording line as well with it. So, um, sorry. Um, this was kind of the end of that research. And um, uh, the conclusions uh, or this, this sort of thing I was thinking about when I was looking at it was, you know, um, is it a futile exercise? Can you, can you actually recreate something that used to be? Because by recreating it, it's no longer the thing it was. Um, and so uh, do you, you know, accept that you know, that that is no longer there. It's not about really repairing something that's there, but if something has been destroyed and it's gone, is it, is there a purpose in reconstructing it? Um, so that was the question that I, that I sort of ended up with. So it's very much open-ended research and it was the beginning of things. Um, and when I was talking to Jason, he, he was uh, asking me to, to, um, to look at my work in the context of, of my earlier training. When I left school, I trained in architectural technology and detailing, and I worked for a good number of years in London working on um, detailing. Detailing was my really my thing because I, I'm really interested in materials and I'm really you know interested in how they behave and in how buildings as complex structures go together and also in, in, in how they move. Uh, and, and how you build something to allow for that, that will, that will last, that will kind of um, uh, work with the behavior of the materials and the building. So one of my specialisms really was working at the junctions of listed buildings and new buildings. And if you know London, um, the city of London, which is where I mainly worked, um, which were commercial buildings. And it's a very, uh, 
intensively developed area. So, you know, you'd be, well, I was working on a site which had a listed building which had to be restored. And then the company I was working for, the firm I was working for would be putting in a new building, but there'd be another firm would be building adjacent to that. And someone else would have built a building 20 years before, 30 years before. It's also very marshy, uh, marshy land. So there were a lot of water pumps and uh, keeping it dry. But, you know, uh, you had to predict the movement of the building where you'd have settlement and heave and and allow for that over the life of the building so it didn't damage adjacent structures. Um, and I, I, I think when I look at my work, it, it is actually a continuation of that because I really love looking at structure and breaking it down into simple, something simple. And I think if you can see the detail, if you can see the joints and the materials and you see how it goes together, it gives you an understanding of the whole. And that's really what I'm interested in is how, how it goes together. Um, looking at the junctions, looking at the movement. And I really brought that into my work in ceramics, which was with my work, a lot of it's about predicting movement and shrinkage and um, and uh, how, how the different complex structures work together and kind of and survive fairly uh, intense heat and drying and movement. Um, so I think, I hope that explains the, my, uh, the connection of the two. And uh, I'd love to get um, other people's um, views on, on repair as, as an indicator of value and the purpose of it, or, or conservation and reinstatement. Um, and, uh, and then I can add it to my research. <laughs> so uh, thank you all for being very patient and listening. Um, and uh, so I'll open it up to other people, I hope. Um, so I press stop share. That's you it. You can do, Nila. Yeah, Nila, that's thank, it. Yeah, okay. uh, th thank you so much. Uh, I, I think we all have observations, questions. Uh, for anyone who does, we can at least start by putting them into the chat. Um, we'll direct you there. But um, uh, to start with, I might just in invite Hugh to make some initial kind of res responses uh, to the, the presentation, yeah. if that's okay, Hugh. That's okay, yeah. Um, I'm, I, I'm not sure that I can make a coherent response, except that maybe by asking some questions or maybe some, uh, some initial um, or sort of aspects of your work, Nola, that, 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 that struck me. Um, firstly, just to say it was really beautiful work and uh, thank you for um, showing it and talking about it um, so clearly and eloquently. Um, I was, I suppose, in the first instance, I was, one thing that that struck me was that you talked, or the aspect of the process that I, I, I'm reckoning, well, would be a complete mystery to me and that I would have, you know, no capacity to, um, or, or skill at all, is the bit that you don't talk about so much, which is the sort of working with the material, you know, to produce so we um, so in the presentation about the you know the 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 flowers and 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 plant forms we have the sort of the source if you like the and then we see your translation of it into ceramic uh, by virtue of a kind of magic it seems to me or a kind of alchemy um and so i was i suppose i was kind of intrigued by that that you that it seemed to me that you would be taking for granted that mastery of the material so that it wasn't really the point somehow you know the point was what where you were going to end up but then you were saying that towards the end of the talk you were talking about how much of your attention is given to the sort of nature of the material you're working with and its capacities particularly in relation to structure but also the way that it moves the way that it um you described at a certain point as it melts in the process at a certain point and, and, and wanting to hang on to that, it's kind of animate properties in some way. Um, and I found myself then thinking about whether the material you're working with, <coughs> is it important? I mean, it seems to me that it work structurally, it would work in a very different way, obviously, than a, a you know, the, the stalk of a plant or the branch of a tree or the, um, a piece of scaffold um, that you know its structural properties are different. It would be very fragile um, in in compression, 
for instance, would be very fra fragile under any kind of pressure. Um, so is it of interest to you, the sort of structural performance of ceramic vis-a-vis -vis the structural performance of the things from which one, from which you were deriving uh, your forms? I don't know if that even makes sense as a question. It's maybe more of an observation. Yeah, it does make sense. Um, I think in, in some, well, in terms of material, um, I, I, I work with clay, but I, I don't know a huge amount about it in a sense. You know, I'm not, I wouldn't know the chemical composition of it or what you mix to get one or the other. I suppose I, I have an aim and I, um, the quality of, that appeals to me most about clay is that there is an element of chance um, and there's uh, a sort of an unknown outcome. So that I, you know, I, I, I heard a quote from an artist once who was asked, why do, you, why do you paint? Why do you make that? And they just said, I make it because I want to see what it looks like. And that's why I make work. I make it because I want to see what it looks like. And, you know, I'll make it up to a certain point and the material will have certain qualities. But post firing, it has a very different quality. It's much harder, it, it, it's slightly translucent, and it will usually have moved in some way. It's almost like it has a life of its own. So um, I, I, I was thinking about that with working with materials from trees in that um, it's, a, it, it's the same but different because, because that is the way it is. Like if you use the, the stems of the, the branches, that's the way they're going to be now. And that's the, that, that's the way they will be. They won't change their quality. Um, so it's almost like I'd need to know the outcome before starting, which to me isn't as interesting. Yeah. So it's really the, the sort of unpredictability, a sort of metamorphosis that I really, really like about clay. So is that why you are <clears throat> initially, uh, you had this interest in um, uh, fractals and, you know, chaos theory and so on. I mean, the idea that there would be an unordered order or an emergent order or something, mm. Mm. Um, let's say, fixed uh, and, 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 and pure. Um, because it would seem to me that you, notwithstanding your interest in chance, I can't imagine that you would be putting one of those pieces that you showed in the early series into fire without a pretty good idea that it was going to, you know, it was going to hold together. In other words, you, you would already be working with the logic of the material. Mm. Or, or is that not the case? Maybe that's, maybe I'm wrong. Well, when I start working in a series, I don't know how it will behave. I don't know how the structure will behave. I assume it'll be strong because it's a three-dimensional pattern. It's not, you know, it, that it's a lots of, it's almost like, I mean, it is like building where you take a brick and you build a building. It's a tiny modular element you put together in a certain way. So in that sense, um, I, you know, I would be conscious of how that goes together and how that works. But sometimes it does surprise me. And I have made big mistakes like, putting in a piece that had the, the large grids at the bottom and the small grids at the top. So of course, all the weight was at the top and it just didn't occur to me <laughs> that, you know, when it was in that almost not slightly fluid state, of course, because the weight will push down on the, on the larger grids. And you just learn by your mistakes. I think mistakes, you learn so much by them because I'll never do that again, you know, it was interesting to see what it did and I could use it in another piece, but it, I learned a lot from it. I mean, you learn a lot from mistakes, mm. how things, what things will, what will happen. So in a way then the forms that you, you end up with, if I can put it like that, are the result of a process, a sort of evolution, if you like, where you're. Yeah. 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 What survives, what doesn't. Yeah. And scale a part of that because I actually, I was thinking again, as you were talking, I have no idea what size these pieces are until you finally showed a, you know, they could have been, as you said, vast or, yeah. or, inter, or tiny. So it just get, and of course structure doesn't, doesn't scale necessarily, mm. you know, necessarily work at a small scale and a big scale in the same way. So is scale a, a consideration 
for you? Scale, yeah, scale, scale is really dictated for me by the size of the kiln. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's as big as I can go. <laughs> and I would love one of those kilns that's got a trolley thing that you put the thing on and you wheel it in. But, you know, I have to lift those pieces either on a kiln shelf or whatever. And, you know, it's very, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not good for your back. <laughs> leaning into a kiln um so it really yeah i think that you know i think if you look at the sort of scale of things they build in jingdezhen in china you know it's it's to do with it's to do with the size of the kiln because it is and also you'd have to be conscious of the larger the scale the heavier the piece so the 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 pieces below would have to be stronger. Now I do do that with, with pieces. I mix different types of porcelain and I use the, uh, you know, I know when they're strong pre or post firing. So I would tend to mix my materials uh, uh, so mm. that I have the strength and things that need to be strong after firing and I have strength things that need to be strong before. So you spoke about a lot of, well, you spoke, uh, at, throughout, let's say, about repair and, and, and this very interesting observation about the repair being offering evidence of value, you know, because mm -hmm. repaired it has value. And, and I, but I, I didn't, or maybe I didn't catch whether that's a sort of strategy that you try to fold into your own work as well in some way that you make, that, you know, that you would make something that has evidence of repair within it. it it's yeah, not, yeah. I do, yeah, and and I find it the most interesting part of something, uh -huh. and you know, um, to me, it's a record of an event. I, I think it's kind of like everybody's got things uh, that they own, and or you know that you've got a scar in your hand, whatever. And every time you see that scar, you remember where you got it, mm -hmm. you know. Or if you see somebody that has a very, you know, I think it 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 it, it, it suggests the narrative. And it is, there is a story behind it. Um, so, uh, and it's kind of relates to contemporary culture too, and that kind of aspiration to perfection. Um, and uh, it's a skewing of an aesthetic, I think. Um, and it was part of the research that I was interested in doing and something I, I wanted to think about when I, when I went to Paris to develop new work um, and looking at uh, extending my own work. And I was looking at um, the idea of prosthetics, um, not the idea of them, the reality of them, and how um, you know that there's if you if you approach it from a purely functional point of view, they're quite beautiful. I think they're they're elegant, and incredibly, you know, uh, they surpass the original. I think, mm. um, and you've seen that in athletics, I suppose, in recent history, where you know able-bodied athletes subjected to an athlete who did have prosthetics and competing against them because they pointed out that he had an unfair advantage. And I, I when I heard that that time, I just thought that's, that's quite a moment to say that. Mm. And it just raised a lot of questions and issues about the repaired or the, or the, the addition surpassing it also raises the question, and actually, I'm conscious there's a couple of questions people. I just thought it was a thing. I'll come to we might come to them as well. But I was also just thinking about, I guess, performance in the sense of, oh, I mean, nature is natural forms evolve in order to perform mm -hmm. whatever function they need to perform. You mentioned the tree. How do you think of a performance in relation to your own work if it if it doesn't have that imperative to you know, to, to stay alive in the first instance, yeah. to, to grow. What is it that, that tells you, what is, what is the imperative that, 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 that drives its form, let's say? Um, for me, it, I suppose for me, they're, they're an exploration. They're an exploration of aesthetics, of, of geometry, of perception. Um, so they have a function for me. Um, and I think when they go on to other people or other places, they have a function as well. But I do, th you know, I sort of think in some ways, I think it's just looking more closely at, at, at small things and, and looking at the beauty of them and looking at, um, um, in some ways, pattern is a communic communicator, I suppose, of a narrative. 
and and just indicating that um but that would be for me mm. um, so it's a reflection on and a, a sort of a noticing of that you know because in the way that a prosthetic is like a it has evolved in order to function in certain ways particularly the ones that they use for running which mm. are good I, I imagine for much else but are extremely good for that mm. um so i mean i suppose you you so that your work is kind of a reflection on that yeah i mean i the thing is when i started looking at it i was sort of thinking well uh, it was related to your question i have to define the purpose the function of this addition i have to define the purpose of it because if i don't define the purpose then it's not going to work so that's the kind of hurdle i've fallen at a little bit <laughs> and i want to extend my work i want to make it you know, get past the limitations of of the the weight or the size, and so I just have to define that. And um, I thought that for me, the work in the studio in in Paris and and having to uh, restrict um, what I was doing and and just taking those influences, it kind of helped me define it a bit more. Mm. And I think I probably have to be a bit more ruthless about it mm. uh, because I kind of thought to myself, well, if I can make these structures these things out of, um, you know, pieces of, uh, of tree in autumn, should I make them out of something else? What's the purpose of it if I do? And I kind of thought, well, actually, I kind of like the idea of immediately available materials and reusing them without having to... It starts to engage in a more immediate way. Yeah, yeah, and it's of its place. And yeah, yeah. Um, so if you apply the principles, really, if you're going to stand by them, they should work for anything. That, that would be prompted by the circumstance at least in part, of, of, yeah. of having to engage in that way. There's, there's questions um, r r racking up here. So I'm maybe uh, some are comments, I think, and some are questions. Um, I'm going to go, Chris, Chris has a couple. Well, he's come back in with another one as well. So Chris has got, is mentioning the ideas of, of protecting trees. And you, of course, Christo and Jean-Claude have done that a lot with, you know, the wrapping of trees. Which, you know, that, that, that work that they did where they wrapped Mm -hmm. trees and these kind of silvery I think it was the Bayeller Foundation in um, Switzerland maybe that they did that for um, but they are the, and he's mentioning the Japanese practice of yukitsuri um, which I assume Chris is a, is a tree wrapping kind of practice um, and suitably festive um, I'm, it, Chris also has an interesting question about um, whether you would consider 3D printing something um, yeah um, I'd love to, but it's kind of, I just have to learn the program and I'm just not up for that. I don't want to learn Rhino, but if someone else would do it for me, I'd love it. <laughs> I'd love it. It's just, a kind of hurdle I don't, it's something I, I don't have to learn. And so I'm a bit lazy as, you know, as you could see from my Zoom performance earlier. <laughs> I see enough of computers yeah. and, uh, uh, but I'd love to work with somebody who worked with it because I think then you know, based on fractal geometry, you could take one of those forms and infinitely repeat it if you had, a, you know, if you had that program and look at how it evolved. So, yeah, I'd love to do it, but I'm not going to. Uh... So the, the sort of interest in process and the interest in, let's say, um, imperfections and repair, it doesn't doesn't preclude the idea that you might you might want to have the capacity to quite quickly move to a 3D printout of something. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I'd love to try it. I think it would be interesting to try it because I think it's an amazing tool, um, and see, and see what see what you think afterwards, see what it looks like. As that famous quote. <laughs> You've got a, a lead there from Eva Brown who's saying that Fab Lab in Limerick has got a clay three D printer. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There yeah. are some. They they have really gone a long way with it. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that might be somewhere to go. Yeah. And maybe, maybe. I kind of, there's one thing about the 3D printing, I suppose, maybe that doesn't really grab me. And I think it's that idea of narrative within a piece and time. That's and right. I yeah. think that, you know, when I look at any of my pieces, for me, it's of its time. I can, you know, it brings me back to that. And I think the thing is, if you do anything, uh, you know, if you sketch, if you draw, if you record something, um, it, it's just that that engagement with it, 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 it's much more personal. Whereas I think you could engage with 3D printing 
at a different point, but I think with the end result, I don't know if it would have the same sort of resonance for me. Yeah. yeah. But, but who knows, you know, it wouldn't have... But there might be ways of manipulating it or working within that. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a great tool. I think there's something, it backs to that idea of animate and inanimate, isn't it? That there's something... Yeah, know, yeah. This might be just my observation, but I, it seems to me that 3D printed models all, never have, never feel animate. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I have a tiny story about 3D printing. I was actually invited to New York. Ah, I, I mean, I was, <laughs> I was invited. I was contacted by the 3D Printers Association uh, by email, and they wrote to me and they said that they were having this big event in, in New York, and would I like to come? And I could bring my work, and they would give me a free stand, and they'd pay my flights. And I thought, brilliant. Yeah, I'd love to go. So anyway, um, I, I said, yeah, I'd love to, you know, sign me up. When will I fly? And then they got back and they said, yeah, well, we'll need to you to demonstrate your program. And I just said, well, I haven't got one. I just have to, I make it by hand. And then they just said, well, no, you can't come. That was the end. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid you're out. Hard and fast rules there. That's terrible. I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't have joined. I think you're right to refuse. I should have just pretended. <laughs> moral high ground there, you know. Um, I, I, a question from Aoife. Well, actually, Steph wants to ask a question about um, repair of ceramics and buildings. Um, and, but if just before you come in, Steph, can I just ask Aoife's question about wonder? You're saying you have a remarkable sense of wonder. How would you suggest one repairs or conserves one's sense of wonder as an artist? I'll just give you an easy one there. Oh. Uh, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I mean, there's so many things to see, aren't there? That there's so many, uh, maybe you just have to have time. Maybe I've got loads of time to look at things. I think if you're... I mean, I'm struck by that, like you said, this, when you, obviously the time in Paris, you were seeing new things. Mm -hmm. or, or not, you know, things you might see elsewhere, but the fact of them in Paris maybe meant that you could pay attention to them in a different way or something. Is that, would that be important? Like the idea of going and seeing things and looking? And yeah. Well, you know what? I think when you travel, everything's new. Like you have to figure out how to, what to eat and how to, how to buy it. And, you know, everything's new, you know, so you have to pay attention and you have to pay attention um, in a way that you never do at home because you can never assume anything. So I think that I think traveling to other places does that because you have to kind of rediscover so, everything. So what you're saying is the very thing we can't do now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I feel a bit bad saying, yeah, I, I just came back from Paris. <laughs> I'm going to go. It's a bit of an ordeal. But <laughs> go to Steph and then Jason, and then we probably, I think, out of time. Right. Steph, you. Yeah, um, I think I, I was I was really curious. Um, actually, I really liked the way that you sort of equated um, the, the repair of ceramics and that, that sort of Japanese culture and then also the repair of buildings. I, I've, I've never really like equated the two, but it got me thinking about like th this idea of, of sort of celebrating building fabric as opposed to like restoring something to within the inch of, within like an inch of its life. And I, I kind of was thinking like it does already happen and it's something that also sort of coincides it happens in, in like gentrified areas almost like there, there's almost this idea of, of the, the grunge aesthetic or, or like um, somebody coming in and buying a rundown building and then turning it into like a coffee shop because it looks cool but I I, I, I guess I wonder is there is there a way that like this sort of value of, of, of building for, like because you were talking about like th this idea of repair sort of showing the value of an object and I guess is there a way to to show this value that's socially conscious um like that that's not completely arbitrary um I don't know what are you what are your thoughts um well for, for me I can see the value of 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 repair and maintenance um, but sometimes, you know, when I'm, that's, that's what Notre Dame brought up for me when I was looking at the way they really had gone to great lengths to, to 
catalog and gather all the charred pieces of timber. And when you go into that, when it's restored, Mm-hmm. And you go in there. The amazing thing about, I mean, going into historic buildings, I think, is that for me, the fabric of the building um, has seen so many generations, so many people, and in particular with um, religious buildings, I think there's a lot of sort of emotional investment in them. Mm. Um, but, you know, you, you know, I suppose it's I would compare it to going to Sagrada Familia in in Barcelona. And that building to me would have been more interesting unfinished as Gaudi finished. But I think when people are guessing what he would do, it it's just I wonder at the point of it. And and and, and I I'm not, you know, I'm not saying it's just my personal view. Mm-hmm. I quite like to um I just look at the uh, kind of reinstatement of of places. I think the Glasgow School of Art would be another place that would, would to me, sort of you know you kind of question of uh, what what is the value of reinstating that as it was, mm-hmm. and it isn't what it was. It isn't. It isn't the real thing. Um, and you know. It, do you recreate something and it's it's sort of like that what you're saying about the sort of the grunge recreation it's kind of trying to recreate a sort of edgy feel in a place that isn't edgy anymore mm. why don't you just go to the edgy place if you want <laughs> you know yeah what's the point in going to you know the old irish word maria places mm-hmm. if you can go to the real thing that would be my view but then you know you always know the copy would be good there <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it, it has its purpose, mm-hmm. and at least the building is still there, in, in some way, and being used. And so maybe that's the way buildings are made to be. They evolve, and everybody brings something to them, um, mm. whatever that is. Mm-hmm. Are they more interesting in the end? They're more, they're an evolving thing rather than a static thing. Yeah, true. But I think you know more about that than mm. I. Would. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. Well, you'd have a more informed view of it, I think. And that's just yeah. kind of. Mm. Um, it, it might connect to uh, Jason's question about contingency, which I think Jason wants to ask. Just to note, um, uh, also, uh, Chris had a note about Alan Wexler's. It's in the chat there, Nula, a, a, a link to his scaffolding furniture sculptural work, which might be um, of interest. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm not going to click on the chat thing because I don't know what's going to happen, and I might lose. Uh, we'll grab it and we'll. we'll, we'll I'll have a look at it in a minute. Yeah. We save the chat anyway, so. Yeah, that's great. Jason, I'll go to you. Great, thank you. So um, I might I might sort of shifted somewhat, uh, Nula, from the, the sort of static and the sort of structural uh, question of being so sort of static or, or, or dynamic, <clears throat> and I move it to the ecstatic, uh, which is of course is the the kind of more related to the religious terminologies that were that you're kind of referring to uh, but also kind of particularly kind of objects of ecstasy and I'm kind of thinking um, of things like the kind of crown of thorns that are in that were in Saint uh, Saint Chapelle and then end up in Notre Dame and being so sort of saved and, and I suppose what what made me maybe in one sense kind of think about the objects like that were the relation to the sublime actually um, and but more from the, the point of view of the sublime, referring to kind of things that are dynamic or, or kind of unset, in some way unsettling. Um, so I was kind of thinking of, um, you know, what what Kant talks about. It's a kind of a dynamic relation to a thing or this or the setting. And he says he said, I, I, I sit safely confronting such arresting, awful, fearful representations. So it's it's a kind of sense of being. The, the sense I kind of get from them actually is the precarity, the precariousness, the the, the, the possibility. So in one sense, I think when you photograph them, they uh, are incredibly so stable and uh, they are so full of permanence, you know, because of the material. I think it's hardened, but but of course, I think maybe it's in the in that making process. It's full of. Uh, I mean, everything is is there's a contingency there where things might actually kind of obliterate or explode. So in, it's, in actual fact, the, um, it's incredibly sort of volatile uh, in, in one sense, 
uh, contrasting to the final images of it. And you mentioned the term at the very beginning when you talk about the, you know, the ugliness or oh, the idea of the ugly, you're saying is a kind of classic notion of the ugly. And, and in, in one sense, that, 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 that um, term kind of struck me, whether, you know, that idea that the, the Mark Cousins who wrote about this in an essay 25 years ago, he talks about how the, you know, how ugliness can both deform a work, but also can paradoxically strengthen it. And it's, that's the kind of contingency that I, I think that I was kind of, I was wondering if that's something that is, pl that plays in on the conceptualizations of it or whether it, you know, you don't want to, you know, is, that, is it, uh, is it outside your practice or are you kind of in the middle of that mix of, of being forming, but, you know, understanding the obliteration moment at, 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 as, as being possible? Mm. It, you know, I think uh, I, I, I'm interested in that whole idea of, of, of ugliness. There's a term for it, isn't there? Was something so ugly, it's actually, the, it has a beauty in it. I, I can't remember what the term is. In fact, it's in a book up there. It's called- yeah, it, it, I think the idea but, of the, that the, the, the ugliness both complicates beauty, but it then yeah. enhances it, yeah, yeah. surpasses it, yeah. But I think that, um, you know, I sort of, in some ways see a lot of my work as, as a progression and that, you know, at each point they're progressing along um, a sort of development. And even though I, I have had pieces um, explode one ex spectacularly into tiny, tiny shards. But when I, you know, when I look at it and I sort of think, I suppose it, it's, it depends on your view of the making. And for me, something is precious to me until it's finished. Uh, because uh, I want to get it finished to see it. And once I've seen it, and once it's finished, for me, I disengage from it. And, um, I, you know, if I dropped a piece that was finished and, and I'd photographed it and everything, to be honest, it wouldn't really bother me. It wouldn't, I wouldn't be upset because it has, for me, that is the, you know, I've, it's fulfilled its purpose. Mm. And, you know, I'd be upset if I'd sold it. But you know, but if I hadn't, um, but it, you know, to to lose something before it's concluded uh, would for me be the loss, um, because I would have put time into it, and and I you know, and I want to see what how it performs, how it, what it does, with the pieces that have sort of something's happened in the process. Sometimes I'm kind of looking at them and I think, well, I can use those parts in something else. What about if I cast them into something? Because now I've got all these bits, but you know, they're no longer precious and therefore they're kind of, they're available material for something else. And it's something I think that, um, I know that when I, when I, you know, when I was studying at Middlesex, it was something you were very much forced to do was to destroy work so that you didn't become overly attached to the outcome that you the process was more important and you know uh, that has stayed with me that um being able to just leave it once it's finished um with the i you know uh, what you were saying about the aesthetic with it i think with some of the pieces i've sort of looked at that and i uh, that that um aesthetic and then sort of countered it by using proportion and ratio to see if you could change the perception of the piece, which is quite ugly, but um, it's, they're almost the pieces I'd have more affection for. They, they sort of, uh, uh, like there's one of the, but, but it was um, one piece which was very strictly went with proportional volumes in the end and it just had a quality to it so um you know i'd be conscious of it of, of what you're saying but i i kind of see it as part of the process did that make did that make sense yeah yeah but i think it yeah. is when, when you say that the kind of quality to it i mean it does it does make me think um you know of kind of relics and reliquaries oh you yeah know? yeah so i was thinking of the crown of thorns and that the the thing kind of exudes you know an atmosphere, you know, 
Uh, that's, that's because of the way it's treated, isn't it? You know, I mean, I've looked at reliquaries. I was quite fascinated them by them when I was uh, doing a, uh, when I was in middle section. I looked at churches and the layering of light and barriers and creating preciousness by impeding your progress until you sort of went up the, you went, you know, past layers of barriers. And so only the most sort of perfect and the most sort of ordained people could be closest to the object of, which was in the gold box. And, you know, if you stand back and look at it, if you, if you don't have all of that, if you don't have that kind of knowledge and history, if you, if you just came from another culture and you walk in there and you say, well, you know, there's all this grandeur and layers, and then you get to the point, like with the reliquary, you look in the center of it and it's a tiny piece of wood. Um, and it's, it's, it's creating a ceremony, it's creating a value, the layers coming up to it. And then at the end, it's something pretty inconsequential on its own, you know, if you took it out and you put it to the side and if you put the crown of thorns out on the street, it, it would be swept up and, you know, um, but um, yeah, I suppose that's, isn't that your community creates that value? Uh, that we as a community, it has to be a communal thing. Like wouldn't be just one person. Everybody has to agree to it. 